City Office is going to talk about a parameter that's available on the SPC mesoscale analysis page, but maybe is not quite widely used as some of the other parameters. So it's going to be fun to listen to what Matt has on his take on the bulk Richardson number. So Matt, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you everyone for showing up today. I've got a couple items to mention as well. I just have 35 slides, so we should be done in 45 minutes. So if you have a meeting or another webinar at the top of the next hour, we'll get you there. Also, I've noticed that if I have, I usually have two browsers open and each have 20 tabs, and it tends to slow my system down. So if you have any issues of seeing the slides advance or animations, you may wanna actually close some of those. And then finally, we will be doing some polling here actually on the next slide. So you can either do it via the web or your mobile device. So anyway, last year, Central Region had a foundational training team that looked at various training items. And one of the things that was noted that there are some things that would be good to review. So I've decided to address the bulk Richardson number that may be a review for many of you. Uh, for some, it may be new if you're relatively new to the agency. This was something that was developed in the early 80s for convective storms. So with that background, we will start off with the first poll question, a very simple one here. And have you heard of the bulk Richardson number before today? I'll give uh, a little while here before I reveal the responses. And I know there is some weather obviously going on across the region, so we'll see how many people are able to attend today. There might not be a lot of responses, but I'll wait till we get a few to roll in here. And if you have any problems with the web-based version up here, just let me know. I think it's working fine uh, when I checked it last. I have two re two results. I'll wait and see if I can get a couple more. I'll go ahead and vote myself to increase the sample size here. All right, so there we go. And actually, I was pretty impressed here. All, um, all respondees have indicated they have heard of this before. That's good. I thought there might be a few, but uh, if there's some really new people in the weather service that are watching today, I suspect that you've actually touched on that perhaps in college. So that's good that that's still being addressed. So let's look at the next question. And so well, this is a little bit more challenging than the previous. What is the formulation of the bulk Richardson number? Is it the CAPE times shear? Is it the shear divided by CAPE? Or is it the CAPE divided by the shear? And again, I'll wait until I have at least at least five responses coming in here before I go ahead and reveal the responses. And if you don't know, just go ahead and guess. It's no big deal. Uh, <laughs> You're not being, I know we have midterms coming up here pretty soon, but you're not gonna be rated on, on this question. So don't worry about that. There we go. All right, so we got CAPE times shear with the 17% then CAPE divided by shear of 83, which is the correct answer. Uh, but just, I will note that CAPE times shear is the SIG severe parameter by Craven and Brooks. So if you pick that answer, that's probably what you were thinking of. So it's good to see that most people have this down. Now we will look at then the last, question before we get into the presentation. What range of bulk Richardson net, uh, values or bulk Richardson number values are favorable for supercells? We have the four ranges here. Uh, pick one that you think is the most favorable for supercells to occur. Just need to get one more response. And there we go. All right, so 10 to 50 is what we were kind of looking for, 50 to 80. That's quite possible to get supercells in that range as well. So these are all um, reasonable answers here. All right, so let's go ahead and move on and get started here. So again, the bulk Richardson number is essentially, it's the ratio of buoyancy divided by shear. So if you have a high 
BRN, you have a lot more buoyancy relative to shear, and vice versa, if you have a low BRN, you're in a shear-dominated environment. Again, this was applied in the early 1980s. There are two very classic papers by Wiseman and Klemp. There's links here to them, and I'll share this presentation out with uh, either Jeff or Randy when they send out the YouTube video. Classic papers on that. So again, the range of 10 to 50 favors supercells. The key is here it favors. It doesn't mean supercells only occur in that range, uh, but it definitely favors them. And when you are greater than 50, it tends to favor non-supercells. It doesn't mean that supercells won't happen when the BRN is greater than 50. And then finally, if the BRN is really small, less than 10, you're in a shear dominated environment and it's unlikely to get uh, much sustained convection at that point. But if you do, it can be quite amazing because of the strong shear and, and the effects that the shear has on the convection. So again, this study is motivated by the foundational review and the team that uh, Central Region had last year to, to review some of these topics that have been around a while, but maybe have fallen out of favor. And so that's, that's a key reason why I'm doing this. And uh, I will note that most of this presentation, therefore, is review. There's a very small part of it, as you noted, maybe on the title slide, done this with Roger Edwards and we there's a small part of it that uh, is new and that uh, we look at tornadoes related to the bulk Richards number but that's a really small part another reason why I'm motivated by this is because I had a reviewer of a recent paper suggest that the BRN be abandoned entirely and I disagree with that obviously otherwise I wouldn't be doing this presentation and so that's uh, another motivation for this so let's uh, first of all as Jeff mentioned at the beginning the bulk Richardson number has been available on the SPC mesoanalysis page for quite some time. It's just under the composite indices. You go down a ways, it says bulk Richardson number. And again, it's the mixed layer. It's using the mean layer cape for the buoyancy part of that equation. And then, of course, there's a help function. This is an event that I grabbed back in January where there were several tornadoes in the southeastern U.S. And you can see uh, the bulk Richardson number is in the range of that uh, 10 to 50 in that area where you have the tornado. So this is just an example that shows how it might be applied and spe specifically that it is available, if you're wondering. It's also in the AWIPS volume browser. So we're gonna look at the high BRN case here. And what we see is we, we will see some supercells, but they don't last very long. They dissipate and then another one forms that doesn't last very long and then it dissipates. So this is kind of a multicellular supercell case if there is such of a thing where you don't have one single storm lasting a very long time. When we look at the environment for this, using the, uh, the uh, Omaha sounding, we see ML Cape of 4,700, so quite, quite large. Uh, and then when we look at the mixed layer BRN, we have 169, so that's also quite high. Again, that's in that area where you're really buoyancy dominated, and that's consistent with the shorter lived storms. Note that the bulk six wind difference is nearly 43 knots, and you certainly have plenty of low-level shear for some tornadoes. So that doesn't mean you can't get a supercell, doesn't mean you won't get a tornado on that day, but it gives you an idea of the nature of that convection, which is very unsteady, very short-lived supercells. Now we're going to look at a case where we had a low bulk Richardson number. I chose this simply because I had a time lapse that it could match up with radar data. This was along the eastern Black Hills. So you can see very shear dominated type of convection. It showed 50 dBZ for just a scan or two here. Otherwise, it just could not sustain itself. When we look at this environment, we see that the ML Cape was just 145. This is a modified 12Z sounding for the afternoon conditions when I took that video. The BRN, again, quite low at eight. Still have plenty of zero to six bulk wind difference of 44 to 45 knots. So a lot of shear, similar to the last example, but here we had so much less buoyancy, so much less cape. So very different, you know, very similar bulk shear, but very different cape, and also plenty of, of low level shear on this case as well. So now we will go to the porridge is just right, so to speak. Here's a, the Chapman tornado case from May 25th, 2016. The incipient uh, stages of the storm seen here in the picture. And we have a supercell that was very steady, uh, produced an EF4 tornado near Chapman. And even though there was another storm nearby, you see that the primary supercell just maintained itself, lasted a long time, very, very well defined. So let's look at this environment via the Topeka sounding. And we see now the, cape, the ML Cape was 1700. So 
it was 3,000 less than the one that we showed from Omaha earlier. Uh, the BRN in that sweet spot, so to speak, of 38. Notice the bulk shear in this case was 36 knots from zero to six, so less than the other two examples, yet we had a much more impressive outcome illustrating, I think, the relevance of looking at the balance or the ratio between the cape and the shear in the formulation of, again, the bulk Richardson number. All right, so here's yet another example just to show that if you have a bulk Richardson number that favors supercells, in this case it was 21, so it favors supercells, it doesn't mean you can't have linear convective mode. So I would caution you to think that the BRN also applies to the steadiness of your storm. So in this case, we had a steady supercell and a steady um, quasi-linear convective system. Another thing to note about this, and this is, I'll refer you, or you can refer to the mesoscale environmental analysis course, but there's a lot more to convective mode forecasting than just looking at a single parameter like the BRN. What is the strength of the surface forcing? Is there a boundary? What's the boundary relative flow, for example? The orientation of the deep layer shear vectors with respect to the forcing and so forth. Turns out that this line formed ahead of a fairly strong upper wave that was approaching and supercell formed out ahead. So again, think that the BRN can be used and it's been applied for supercell forecasting, but also think of it in terms of the, your steadiness of your convection. So now we're going to start looking at results from the previous study. So again, in 1982 is really when the BRN was brought into the, the convective storms forecasting arena. The, the bulk Richardson number existed well before that, but this was studied by Wiseman and Clamp, and they, they did some modeling, and of course they modeled supercells, which they indicate here as split storms, and then they had other storms that were multi-cells. They called them secondary storms. This red line indicates the BRN value of 40, to the left is less than, to the right, of course, is greater than. And so they have this little bit of overlap here, right around 40. Now, back in 1982, they didn't have GR2 analysts, so they couldn't go look at, you know, we didn't have the ADAD network, so you couldn't really go out and, and look at storms. So they had to actually pull paper or look at papers that were published that documented supercells. That's what they did here. So these are supercells that were documented in the literature with corresponding environmental information. Here's one that was more of a broken line that had, had a supercell, so a little bit higher bulk Richardson number. And then the observed multi-cells and miscellaneous convection was greater than 50, and these are documented here. And there may have been some tropical cases in there as well. So that was in the early 1980s. Go forward 10 years, Kelvin Drogemeyer and others did a study with more advanced modeling at that point and more different parameter space, different photograph shapes. So again, the, the 40 BRN line here is in red and values to the right are less than 40 to the left, uh, greater than 40. So you see these S's here indicate supercell simulations. The M's were multi-cell simulations. So basically, Drogemeyer confirmed uh, the earlier results of Weissman and Clamp. Then in 1998, there was an observational study di uh, done by Eric Rasmussen and David Blanchard. And so they have these three categories, ordinary, supercell, and tornado. But I do want to point out what they really are. So the tornado category is F2 or greater reports. They didn't really classify the convective mode, but what they're saying is that if it was F2 or greater reports, it was likely a supercell. Their category that they called supercell really was hail two inches or greater with F0 and F1 tornadoes allowed. And then finally, the ordinary category was no hail greater than two inches and no tornadoes and no wind damage. So we've seen a lot of supercells that have had hail, you know, uh, ping pong or golf ball. So that would they would fall into this ordinary category. And in some cases, you know, we might know they're producing larger hail, we just don't get the report. So the point being that there are going to be some supercells mixed into this ordinary category. At any rate, when we look at the 40 BRN line here, we see that the tornadic and supercell categories of their study were, were definitely below that in terms of 90% of the cases. Then when we looked at the ordinary category, which would have some supercells mixed in, we see a lot more of a spread, that definitely the skew towards these higher BRN values of 40 to 140. So as we continue on in history here, this was one done by Richard Thompson and others in 2003, and they actually did categorize the storms by convective mode. And they did use RUC2 soundings, so keep that in mind. These were not observed soundings, but they used RUC2 soundings, so we see a little bit higher bias of the BRN. So now instead of the 40 line, I'm plotting the 55 line. 
and they show they have their category of SIG tour, weak tour, and non tour, and they're all below that the 55. So they're in the lower bulk Richardson number range, which you would expect for supercells. And then their marginal supercell category or weekly supercell category had values that were much higher, mostly higher uh, above or greater than 55. And then the non supercell cases were well above. Uh, most most all of them were well above the 55, at least uh, 75 to 80 percent of those cases. So this again fits pretty well with the earlier modeling work. This is one of the better studies as far as validating that earlier modeling work. So then in 2006, I did some research with a few forecasters here at the office in Rapid City, and we looked at supercell longevity with long-lived supercells being a supercell that lasted at least four hours. Short-lived supercells lasted two hours or less, and then moderate-lived supercells in between. And what we found was that your long-lived supercells had a very compressed range of bulk Richardson numbers, so they were in that very balanced state, if you will, between uh, between buoyancy and shear. Moderate-lived supercells were still mostly below 40 for a BRN, but a little bit higher. And then the short-lived supercells had several of those supercells that had much higher BRNs than what you would normally expect for supercells. So this is consistent with not only the, the bulk Richards number applying to forecasting supercells, but also the steadiness and the longevity of, of the supercells. So now getting a little bit closer to where uh, Roger and I started to do work, so this is leading into that. Uh, there was a study by Calhoun and Riley in 1996 that compared the BRN to the Fujita scale tornado ratings. And I just want to point that they looked at tornado ratings and, and they actually labeled tornado intensity in their paper, but the EF scale doesn't measure intensity, it measures damage. So that's it's really important. You can have a tornado that's, you know, say very intense based on what the Dow might measure, but if it doesn't hit anything, it might be rated you know, EF unknown or EF zero. So definitely uh, keep that in mind. Tornado rating does not equal tornado damage. And uh, I believe that. Uh, Calhoun and Riley didn't really separate out their modes. They probably had a fair number of supercells, but cannot confirm that they were all that, that way. Anyway, they found a negative uh, relation, a negative correlation. So hit F scale here is in red from zero to five, and then the BRN, which they call the BRI, uh, the mean values increased from 99 for the zero category to 30 for two, for 11, for five, for smaller sample up there. So they're, they're seeing um, relationships such that the BRN decreases with stronger uh, or higher rated tornadoes. So that, and that makes sense. Then there's a study by Johns and other uh, in this book called The Tornado. And you may, uh, every office if, in the weather service, at least in central region, should have this book in your library. So if you're wondering like where where this come from, there's a book called The Tornado. It's about two inches thick and it's got several good papers in there from back in the early 90s. And they showed the BRN values decreasing as you go to the left here on the x-axis as you had more tornadic cases. And actually a lot from zero to seven, which at first I thought, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But they did have some high shear low cape cases in their data set, also likely some tropical cases. So you're looking at a different climatology in the sense of some tornado events versus the typical Great Plains, Central US kind of tornadoes and tornadic supercells. Okay, so that leads up to the present study that I did with Roger Edwards, and it's very short. I don't have many slides to present on that, but we were just interested in, is there any relationship to when you have big tornado days and the Buck Richardson number? So we looked at uh, 286 tornado days where we had nearly 7,000 tornadoes across the CONUS, most of them in the central and eastern US, and we evaluated several things, after EF scale, length, width, et cetera. We did require that we had at least three plus SIG tours per day. So that meant we had mostly supercells in these events. And um, that's what a lot of what they have in their convective mode data set. And then we compared these tornado statistics to the mixed layer BRN as defined on the SBC MISO analysis page. And we thank Andy Dean, who did a lot of work to dig up that data for us. So here's a, the first graph that I wanna show. And essentially we're looking at quintiles or equally binned a uh, number of uh, gr or groups of tornadoes. So on the left here, we have events that have less than 19 tornadoes. The next bin is 19 to 30 tornadoes, et cetera. But all these are trying to have the equal, uh, an equal number or quasi equal number. 
And what we see here is basically there's no relationship between the number of tornadoes on a given day and the BRN. Uh, but you do see that all of, uh, most all of the examples fall below the BRN 50 line here. So they're all just, they're all quite low. Uh, so when you have significant tornadoes, at least three and, and several, no matter if it's less than 19 up to greater than six, uh, 67, you have a very constant range of the bulk Richardson number. And it doesn't really say anything about area, and I'll discuss a little bit about that later on with a few examples. Then we looked at the F or EF scale over the period, and we see that, in a sense, it's consistent with Thompson and all, and that it doesn't matter if you have zero all the way up to five, you have fairly low BRN. So they're not really discriminating between or among the tornado damage ratings, but we see the slight decrease here from zero to, to two, and that's loosely consistent with the Calhoun study that I mentioned earlier, but then actually a slight increase later on. So, you know, what's going on here? It's hard to say because the sample size is small at, at uh, n equal nine for the F and EF five category. It might imply, you could speculate that maybe for these really intense or the most damaging tornadoes that you need a lot, you know, a lot of CAPE large cape. There also could, again, be a sample size issue there. And definitely there's an issue going on on the lower end because there are some likely more damaging tornadoes that are in this low category. They just didn't hit anything. So that's going to affect that. Uh, bottom line is it's consistent with Thompson and the, the signal isn't as clear of, of a decreasing, or I should say, large BRN for the EF0 to smaller BRN at uh, EF5. And again, slightly differences in the data set, as I mentioned earlier. So now when we look at path length, we see just a very subtle decrease from short path, less than 0.8 kilometers to greater than 12.5. So very subtle, slight diminishing of BRN as you go from shorter to longer path length. The same can be said for path width, just a very subtle, not statistically significant, uh, decrease as you go from narrower tornadoes to wider tornadoes in as much as or whatever we know about how accurate that our width estimates can be. But again, note that all these are below minus 50. Uh, I could have shown you the same thing for the de destruction potential index, but that really showed the same results. So anyway, what this shows is that these events uh, for these tornadoes were in the range that we would expect for supercells, but there isn't much value at all when it, when you're looking at discriminating between tornado damage ratings, which does differ from the Calhoun and Riley 1996 study that we showed earlier. Again, they had a different data set, likely mixed population of convective mode. Uh, but again, this does support the relevance of using the BRN for supercell versus non-supercell environments. So now we'll look at the spatial, a spatial pattern of a few cases. So we didn't look at this in depth, but I just have a, sh a few examples because I wanna show you how that can be applied. So we're gonna start with the big one, 27 April, 2011. And what we have here is a three hour window of reports. And this we're starting at 1330 to 1630Z. And we have the 15Z SBC mesoanalysis for the mixed layer BRN plotted in, I think I actually used QGIS, QGIS for this. So there's um, what we see here then, uh, early in the event, there were a few tornadoes in areas of the BRN that would have been right around say five to 10. Uh, there was some slight transparency going on here, so it might not look like it's totally matching up with the brightness on the left. At any rate, when we move towards 18Z, when the event's just starting to get going, again, we see these tornado reports in this, this lower range of five, maybe up to 25 or 30. These really darker red values are BRNs of 100 or greater. So just so you can kind of get your bearing on what we're looking at. And then once we really get into the thick of thing, we see a thick of things. We see all these tornado reports really in this range of BRN that's uh, very favorable for supercells. If we go on to zero Z, kind of the same thing lining up on the gradient, uh, consistent with some of the work that. Ario Cohen did looking at gradients of things like the SDP. So the gradients can be a highly favorable place for these things to occur. And then as we continue on into the evening, 3Z, we still see that pattern on the lower values of the BRN. And some 
may be indicating where the BRN is zero, but again, this is a RUC um, analysis or it's based on, on the RUC as input. So there can be some issues there with the calculation of CAPE. And then finally, as we go later in the evening, still hanging on to these lower five to 20, 25 type BRN values. So again, it shows uh, based on the analysis, you can have uh, substantial storms when the BRN does get below 10, uh, but you, you need to probably have the convection sustained uh, through some some substantial forcing and maybe other things as well to uh, to realize that. And then finally, I'll just finish up with two examples, uh, just quick examples that I grabbed last year. We have the reports on the left, and I believe it's for the same type of three-hour type window. And we see that from South Central South Dakota through Northern Minnesota, we have the reports that are in this axis of higher BRN values. Again, values greater than uh, greater than 50 are red and then greater than 80 are this dashed brown. So they're in these this higher BRN type of range, which wouldn't necessarily favor supercells. Again, I just grabbed this quick just to show you how you might ap apply this. The same, so this was the same year also last year, but there was the, the one of the more notable to tornadoes of the season west of Lubbock, Texas. And we see here, when we look at the BRN, there's a large area of what we cons would consider a very favorable BRN values for supercells. So uh, this kind of, you know, doesn't say there's tornadoes that are gonna happen everywhere in this region, but again, you can apply this as like, what are, are the conditions kind of in the range you would hope for to get supercellular uh, convection that's very steady. You know, and when I, when I storm chase, I, I look at the BRN and I'll use that sometimes as a deciding factor of, two areas, you know, is this one more likely to support a steadier type of mode or the other one uh, versus the other one? And that, and that does prove to be helpful. It doesn't mean that where you have, say, maybe a higher BRN, you're not gonna get a tornado, but certainly gives you some confidence in the steadiness of the convection in that area. All right, so I just to summarize the examples, I think they show that the BRN can definitely be used as a filter. It has a high probability of detection, but also as we saw a large false alarm area for, tornado, uh, for tornadoes. And so I think it clearly should be used in combination with mesoscale analysis. In the end, it's just one variable, it's just one index, but I think it has the utility and that's hence the reason why I gave the presentation today. And I think the importance is to go beyond just looking at the shear and isolation, because recall the first three examples that I showed, the bulk shear was similar among those three, and the one that actually produced the EF4 tornado had slightly weaker bulk shear than the other two. All right, so we have one last poll question here. We'll see how many people we get to respond. So how likely are you to use the BRN after viewing this presentation? So if you use it all the time, you know, the same as before, but if you haven't used it much and you're a little bit more expired, uh, inspired, more likely than before, and if you were sleeping, um, somebody wake up whoever's sleeping and have them fill out the poll with, question, with option D here. <laughs> and I'll go ahead and show the results and then I think we're gonna be done here. All right, excellent. So apparently the people that are sleeping haven't gotten up to answer this yet. So thank you for your attention. That brings me to the end. I'll just stop here at the conclusions slide and open it up for questions. All right, thanks, Matt. Really interesting presentation. Some things that maybe not thought about before. So yeah, we have opportunity for questions from Matt right now. So if you have a question, go ahead and raise your electronic hand or pop that into the questions pane. And if we don't get any here in the first 30 to 60 seconds or so, I'll just go ahead and unmute everybody. So not seeing any so far. There's nothing in the questions mm. pane. Yeah, so nobody really likes to ask the first question, so I'll go ahead and ask it for you. Um, Matt, would you use the BRN to make a decision on a tornado warning? And I'd say the answer is no. There's much other things to, to look at, so I wouldn't use it for that, but I would look use it to determine if I'm going to go chase in this one area versus another area. So thanks for the question. <laughs> and I don't see any more Matt at this point. So I'll, I'll ask one that I've kind of half been thinking about is 
if you assume storms are going to occur, do you think convective inhibition would help delineate any further when you're kind of on the edges of, of supercellular or non supercellular? Do you think that would lead to any more discernment at all? Well, application of the BRN is conditional essentially on you getting convective initiation, getting thunderstorms. Now, having said that, if you have the low BRN, as we saw in that one example, you get convection that really struggles to get going. So in those cases, I think, Jeff, that the inhibition would be important because if you have convection that's struggling against strong shear and you're in a fairly capped environment, I should say, an environment that has a lot of convective inhibition, that would make it even stronger uh, or, or I should say make it even more difficult for that to, to get going. Um, and now on the other side of the spectrum, say you have a higher BRN kind of environment that might be more, you know, lean more towards a multicellular or a less steady supercell. If you got a lot of inhibition in that environment, then this, you might suppress overall convection. So if you get something that can develop and say stay relatively isolated, not have much competition, you can get a storm then that might be able to persist a fair amount of time in that that may be less than favorable, higher BRN type of environment. Okay, very good. So we have two questions that have come in. I'll read the question from Brett McDonald first, and he asks, if there are any caveats about potentially using BRN in areas of complex terrain versus the plains? Yeah, so on the complex terrain, and thinking as you get farther west in the Wyoming where you're at, Brett, you'll have a shallower boundary layer oftentimes, so your moisture will be fairly shallow. So you can get a very different BRN if you calculate using mixed layer cape versus a surface-based cape. You might have like a large surface-based cape because you have shallow moisture that's pooled, but so that would lead to a higher, you know, more surface-based cape, which would lead to a higher BRN. In that case, you might be thinking more towards the, on the higher BRN, maybe less likely for supercells, especially as it gets above 50. But then you might calculate the mixed layer cape in that environment, and that would have a much lower value because it's averaging the lowest 100 millibars, and that would make a smaller BRN. So I, yeah, especially, and it's, so it's not just in higher terrain, but it's where you have shallower moisture. The BRN can be very different versus a, a surface base versus mixed layer, and that's why I would advocate using the mixed layer because it's going to take, you know, take that into account, uh, the, the shallow moisture, because, it, you know, surface-based cape can be very, uh, can be the same when you have deep moisture versus shallow moisture, but that would um, be very different for the mixed layer cape, which would give you a very different BRN. So I guess I rambled on more than I should have there, but I would say the caveat would be stick to the ML cape version of the BRN in that situation. All right, next question we have is from Phil Schumacher. Phil, I have you unmuted if you want to go ahead and ask the question. Okay, uh, thanks, Jeff. Hey, Matt, uh, just a quick question. Um, so do you think there are advantages to using BRN over, say, other composites like the SCP, supercell composite? Um, parameter or, or anything that you, you found, or I, I don't know, you may not have compared it, but even just thinking about it? Yeah, I haven't really done a comparison like that. There are two, you know, the BRN is very specific toward looking at that balance of cape and shear and finding those kind of environments where the supercell composite parameter, not only does it help you identify supercell type of environments, but the larger it gets, it's basically, I think, telling you it could be a more potent environment, so to speak, because you know the cape is larger and that sort of thing. Um, th that would be an interesting thing um, to study. I just have not looked at that. All right, Matt, we'll wait another maybe 15 to 20 seconds here. I think those are the only two questions that showed up in the interface. So I'm gonna go ahead and unmute everybody just in case there are any questions remaining out there. All right, so everybody should be unmuted at this point. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and ask. 
All right. Well, is there anything? All right, well, first of all, I want to thank Matt for joining us today. It was a really interesting presentation, pretty valuable as well, I think. And also wanted to thank everybody who joined in. And we will have the recording this available. Randy usually posts it a day or two after the webinar itself. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll talk to you later. Good luck with the weather the rest of this week.